Chapter eleven of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Chapter eleven. An affectionate exhortation to those who in early life feel themselves disposed to become authors. It was a favourite remark of the late Mr. Whitbread's that no man does anything from a single motive. The separate motives, or rather moods of mind, which produce the preceding reflections and anecdotes have been laid open to the reader in each separate instance. But an interest in the welfare of those who at the present time may be in circumstances not dissimilar to my own at my first entrance into life, has been the constant accompaniment and, as it were, the undersong of all my feelings. Whitehead exerting the prerogative of his laureateship, addressed to youthful poets a poetic charge which is perhaps the best and certainly the most interesting of his works with no other privilege than that of sympathy and sincere good wishes i would address an affectionate exhortation to the youthful literati grounded on my own experience it will be but short for the beginning middle and end converge to one charge never pursue literature as a trade with the exception of one extraordinary man i have never known an individual least of all an individual of genius healthy or happy without a profession that is some regular employment which does not depend on the will of the moment and which can be carried on so far mechanically that an average quantum only of health spirits and intellectual exertion are requisite to its faithful discharge three hours of leisure unannoyed by any alien anxiety and looked forward to with delight as a change in recreation will suffice to realise in literature a larger product of what is truly genial than weeks of compulsion money and immediate reputation form only an arbitrary and accidental end of literary labour the hope of increasing them by any given exertion will often prove a stimulant to industry but the necessity of acquiring them will in all works of genius convert the stimulant into a narcotic motives by excess reverse their very nature and instead of exciting stun and stupefy the mind for it is one contradistinction of genius from talent that its predominant end is always comprised in the means and this is one of the many points which establish an analogy between genius and virtue now though talents may exist without genius yet as genius cannot exist certainly not manifest itself without talents i would advise every scholar who feels the genial power working within him so far to make a division between the two as that he should devote his talents to the acquirement of competence in some known trade or profession and his genius to objects of his tranquil and unbiased choice while the consciousness of being actuated in both alike by the sincere desire to perform his duty will alike ennoble both my dear young friend i would say suppose yourself established in any honourable occupation from the manufactory or counting-house from the law-court or from having visited your last patient you return at evening dear tranquil time when the sweet sense of home is sweetest to your family prepared for its social enjoyments with the very countenances of your wife and children brightened and their voice of welcome made doubly welcome by the knowledge that as far as they are concerned you have satisfied the demands of the day by the labour of the day then when you retire into your study in the books on your shelves you revisit so many venerable friends with whom you can converse your own spirit scarcely less free from personal anxieties than the great minds that in those books are still living for you even your writing-desk with its blank paper and all its other implements will appear as a chain of flowers capable of linking your feelings as well as thoughts to events and characters past or to come not a chain of iron which binds you down to think of the future and the remote by recalling the claims and feelings of the peremptory present but why should i say retire the acts of active life and daily intercourse with the stir of the world will tend to give you such self-command that the presence of your family will be no interruption nay the social silence or undisturbing voices of a wife or sister will be like a restorative atmosphere or soft music which moulds a dream without becoming its object if facts are required to prove the possibility of combining weighty performances in literature with full and independent employment the works of cicero and xenophon among the ancients of sir thomas more bacon baxter or to refer at once to later and contemporary instances darwin and roscoe are at once decisive of the question but all men may not dare promise themselves a sufficiency of self-control for the imitation of those examples though strict scrutiny should always be made whether indolence restlessness or vanity impatient for immediate gratification have not tampered with the judgment and assumed the visit of humility for the purposes of self-delusion still the church presents to every man of learning and genius a profession in which he may cherish a rational hope of being able to unite the widest schemes of literary utility with the strictest performance of professional duties 
among the numerous blessings of christianity the introduction of an established church makes an especial claim on the gratitude of scholars and philosophers in england at least where the principles of protestantism have conspired with the freedom of the government to double all its salutary powers by the removal of its abuses that not only the maxims but the grounds of a pure morality the mere fragments of which the lofty grave tragedians taught in chorus or iambic teaches best of moral prudence with delight received in brief sententious precepts and that the sublime truths of the divine unity and attributes which a plato found most hard to learn and deemed it still more difficult to reveal that these should have become the almost hereditary property of childhood and poverty of the hovel and the workshop that even to the unlettered they sound as commonplace is a phenomenon which must withhold all but minds of the most vulgar caste from undervaluing the services even of the pulpit and the reading-desk yet those who confine the efficiency of an established church to its public offices can hardly be placed in a much higher rank of intellect that to every parish throughout the kingdom there is transplanted a germ of civilization that in the remotest villages there is a nucleus round which the capabilities of the place may crystallize and brighten a model sufficiently superior to excite yet sufficiently near to encourage and facilitate imitation this the unobtrusive continuous agency of a protestant church establishment this it is which the patriot and the philanthropist who would fain unite the love of peace with the faith in the progressive melioration of mankind cannot estimate at too high a price it cannot be valued with the gold of ophir with the precious onyx or the sapphire no mention shall be made of coral or of pearls for the price of wisdom is above rubies the clergyman is with his parishioners and among them he is neither in the cloistered cell nor in the wilderness but a neighbour and a family man whose education and rank admit him to the mansion of the rich landholder while his duties make him the frequent visitor of the farmhouse and the cottage he is or he may become connected with the families of his parish or its vicinity by marriage and among the instances of the blindness or at best of the short-sightedness which it is the nature of cupidity to inflict i know few more striking than the clamours of the farmers against church property whatever was not paid to the clergyman would inevitably at the next lease be paid to the landholder while as the case at present stands the revenues of the church are in some sort the reversionary property of every family that may have a member educated for the church or a daughter that may marry a clergyman instead of being foreclosed and immovable it is in fact the only species of landed property that is essentially moving and circulative that there exist no inconveniences who will pretend to assert but i have yet to expect the proof that the inconveniences are greater in this than in any other species or that either the farmers or the clergy would be benefited by forcing the latter to become either trollibers or salaried placemen nay i do not hesitate to declare my firm persuasion that whatever reason of discontent the farmers may assign the true cause is this that they may cheat the parson but cannot cheat the steward and that they are disappointed if they should have been able to withhold only two pounds less than the legal claim having expected to withhold five at all events considered relatively to the encouragement of learning and genius the establishment presents a patronage at once so effective and unburdensome that it would be impossible to afford the like or equal in any but a christian and protestant country there is scarce a department of human knowledge without some bearing on the various critical historical philosophical and moral truths in which the scholar must be interested as a clergyman no one pursuit worthy of a man of genius which may not be followed without incongruity to give the history of the bible as a book would be little less than to relate the origin or first excitement of all the literature and science that we now possess the very decorum which the profession imposes is favourable to the best purposes of genius and tends to counteract its most frequent defects finally that man must be deficient in sensibility who would not find an incentive to emulation in the great and burning lights which in a long series have illustrated the church of england who would not hear from within an echo to the voice from their sacred shrines at pater aeneas et avunculus exit tector. but whatever be the profession or trade chosen the advantages are many and important compared with the state of a mere literary man who in any degree depends on the sale of his works for the necessaries and comforts of life in the former a man lives in sympathy with the world in which he lives at least he acquires a better and quicker tact for the knowledge of that with which men in general can sympathize he learns to manage his genius more prudently and efficaciously his powers and acquirements gain him likewise more real admiration for they surpass the legitimate expectations of others he is something besides an author and is not therefore considered merely as an author the hearts of men are open to him as to one of their own class and whether he exerts himself or not in the conversational circles of his acquaintance his silence is not attributed to pride nor his communicativeness to vanity to these advantages i will venture to add a superior chance of happiness in domestic life were it only that it is as natural for the man to be out of the circle of his household during the day 
as it is meritorious for the woman to remain for the most part within it but this subject involves points of consideration so numerous and so delicate and would not only permit but require such ample documents from the biography of literary men that i now merely allude to it in transitu when the same circumstance has occurred at very different times to very different persons all of whom have some one thing in common there is reason to suppose that such circumstance is not merely attributable to the persons concerned but is in some measure occasioned by the one point in common to them all instead of the vehement and almost slanderous dehortation from marriage which the misogyn boccaccio addresses to literary men i would substitute the simple advice be not merely a man of letters let literature be an honourable augmentation to your arms but not constitute the coat or fill the escutcheon to objections from conscience i can of course answer in no other way than by requesting the youthful objector as i have already done on a former occasion to ascertain with strict self-examination whether other influences may not be at work whether spirits not of health and with whispers not from heaven may not be walking in the twilight of his consciousness let him catalogue his scruples and reduce them to a distinct intelligible form let him be certain that he has read with a docile mind and favourable dispositions the best and most fundamental works on the subject that he has had both mind and heart open to the great and illustrious qualities of the many renowned characters who had doubted like himself and whose researches had ended in the clear conviction that their doubts had been groundless or at least in no proportion to the counterweight happy will it be for such a man if among his contemporaries elder than himself he should meet with one who with similar powers and feelings as acute as his own had entertained the same scruples had acted upon them and who by after research when the step was alas irretrievable but for that very reason his research undeniably disinterested had discovered himself to have quarrelled with received opinions only to embrace errors to have left the direction tracked out for him on the high road of honourable exertion only to deviate into a labyrinth where when he had wandered till his head was giddy his best good fortune was finally to have found his way out again too late for prudence though not too late for conscience or for truth time spent in such delay is time won for manhood in the meantime is advancing and with it increase of knowledge strength of judgment and above all temperance of feelings and even if these should effect no change yet the delay will at least prevent the final approval of the decision from being alloyed by the inward censure of the rashness and vanity by which it had been precipitated it would be a sort of irreligion and scarcely less than a libel on human nature to believe that there is any established and reputable profession or employment in which a man may not continue to act with honesty and honour and doubtless there is likewise none which may not at times present temptations to the contrary but woefully will that man find himself mistaken who imagines that the profession of literature or to speak more plainly the trade of authorship besets its members with fewer or with less insidious temptations than the church the law or the different branches of commerce but i have treated sufficiently on this unpleasant subject in an early chapter of this volume i will conclude the present therefore with a short extract from herder whose name i might have added to the illustrious list of those who have combined the successful pursuit of the muses not only with the faithful discharge but with the highest honours and honourable emoluments of an established profession the translation the reader will find in a note below am sorgfaltigsten meiden sie die autorschaft zu so früh oder unmeißig gebraucht mag sie den kopf wuster an das herz leer wenn sie auch sonst keine übel folgen gebe ein mensch der nur lieset um zu drücken lieset wahrscheinlich übel und wer jeden gedanken der ihm auf stoffst durch feder und presse versendet hat sie in kurzer zeit alle versandt und wird bald ein blosser diener der druckerei ein buchstabensetzer werden End of chapter eleven chapter twelve of biographia literaria this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee biographia literaria by samuel taylor coleridge chapter twelve a chapter of requests and premonitions concerning the perusal or omission of the chapter that follows in the perusal of philosophical works i have been greatly benefited by a resolve which in the antithetic form and with the allowed quaintness of an adage or maxim i have been accustomed to word thus until you understand a writer's ignorance presume yourself ignorant of his understanding this golden rule of mine does i own resemble those of pythagoras in its obscurity rather than in its depth if however the reader will permit me to be my own hierocles i trust that he will find its meaning fully explained by the following instances 
I have now before me a treatise of a religious fanatic, full of dreams and supernatural experiences. I see clearly the writer's grounds and their hollowness. I have a complete insight into the causes which, through the medium of his body, has acted on his mind, and by application of received and ascertained laws, I can satisfactorily explain to my own reason all the strange incidents which the writer records of himself, and this I can do without suspecting him of any intentional falsehood, as when in broad daylight a man tracks the steps of a traveller who had lost his way in a fog or by a treacherous moonshine, even so, and with the same tranquil sense of certainty, can I follow the traces of this bewildered visionary. I understand his ignorance. On the other hand, I have been reperusing with the best energies of my mind the Timaeus of Plato. Whatever I comprehend impresses me with a reverential sense of the author's genius, but there is a considerable portion of the work to which I can attach no consistent meaning. In other treatises of the same philosopher, intended for the average comprehensions of men, I have been delighted with the masterly good sense, with the perspicuity of the language, and the aptness of the inductions. I recollect likewise that numerous passages in this author, which I thoroughly comprehend, were formerly no less unintelligible to me than the passages now in question. It would, I am aware, be quite fashionable to dismiss them at once as platonic jargon, but this I cannot do with satisfaction to my own mind, because I have sought in vain for causes adequate to the solution of the assumed inconsistency. I have no insight into the possibility of a man so eminently wise, using words with such half-meanings to himself as must perforce pass into no meaning to his readers when, in addition to the motives thus suggested by my own reason, I bring into distinct remembrance the number and the series of great men who, after long and zealous study of these works, had joined in honouring the name of Plato with epithets that almost transcend humanity, I feel that a contemptuous verdict on my part might argue want of modesty, but would hardly be received by the judicious as evidence of superior penetration. Therefore utterly baffled in all my attempts to understand the ignorance of Plato, I conclude myself ignorant of his understanding." In lieu of the various requests which the anxiety of authorship addresses to the unknown reader, I advance but this one, that he will either pass over the following chapter altogether, or read the whole connectedly. The fairest part of the most beautiful body will appear deformed and monstrous, if dissevered from its place in the organic whole. Nay, on delicate subjects, where a seemingly trifling difference of more or less may constitute a difference in kind, even a faithful display of the main and supporting ideas, if yet they are separated from the forms by which they are at once clothed and modified, may perchance present a skeleton indeed, but a skeleton to alarm and deter. Though I might find numerous precedents, I shall not desire the reader to strip his mind of all prejudices, nor to keep all prior systems out of view during his examination of the present, for in truth such requests appear to me not much unlike the advice given to hypochondriacal patients in Dr. Buchan's domestic medicine, vide licet, to preserve themselves uniformly tranquil and in good spirits, till I discovered the art of destroying the memory a parte post, without injury to its future operations, and without detriment to the judgment. I should suppress the request as premature, and therefore, however much I may wish to be read with an unprejudiced mind, I do not presume to state it as a necessary condition. The extent of my daring is to suggest one criterion, by which it may be rationally conjectured beforehand, whether or no a reader would lose his time and perhaps his temper, in the perusal of this or any other treatise constructed on similar principles. But it would be cruelly misinterpreted as implying the least disrespect either for the moral or intellectual qualities of the individuals thereby precluded. The criterion is this. If a man receives as fundamental facts, and therefore, of course, indemonstrable and incapable of further analysis, the general notions of matter, spirit, soul, body, action, passiveness, time, space, cause and effect, consciousness, perception, memory, and habit, if he feels his mind completely at rest concerning all these, and is satisfied, if only he can analyse all other notions into some one or more of these supposed elements, with plausible subordination and apt arrangement, to such a mind I would as courteously as possible convey the hint that for him the chapter was not written. Via bonus est, doctus prudens, est how tibi spiro. For these terms do in truth include all the difficulties which the human mind can propose for solution. Taking them therefore in mass and unexamined, it required only a decent apprenticeship in logic to draw forth their contents in all forms and colours, as the professors of legerdemain at our village fairs pull out ribbon after ribbon from their mouths, and not more difficult is it to reduce them back again to their different genera. But though this analysis is highly useful in rendering our knowledge more distinct, it does not really add to it. It does not increase, though it gives us a greater mastery over, the wealth which we before possessed, for forensic purposes, for all the established professions of society, 
this is sufficient but for philosophy in its highest sense as the science of ultimate truths and therefore scientia scientiarum this mere analysis of terms is preparative only though as a preparative discipline indispensable still less dare a favourable perusal be anticipated from the proselytes of that compendious philosophy which talking of mind but thinking of brick and mortar or other images equally abstracted from body contrives a theory of spirit by nicknaming matter and in a few hours can qualify its dullest disciples to explain the omne scibile by reducing all things to impressions ideas and sensations but it is time to tell the truth though it requires some courage to avow it in an age and country in which disquisitions on all subjects not privileged to adopt technical terms or scientific symbols must be addressed to the public i say then that it is neither possible nor necessary for all men nor for many to be philosophers there is a philosophic and inasmuch as it is actualized by an effort of freedom and artificial consciousness which lies beneath or as it were behind the spontaneous consciousness natural to all reflecting beings as the elder romans distinguished their northern provinces into cisalpine and transalpine so may we divide all the objects of human knowledge into those on this side and those on the other side of the spontaneous consciousness citra et trans conscientiam communem the latter is exclusively the domain of pure philosophy which is therefore properly entitled transcendental in order to discriminate it at once both from mere reflection and representation on the one hand and on the other from those flights of lawless speculation which abandoned by all distinct consciousness because transgressing the bounds and purposes of our intellectual faculties are justly condemned as transcendent the first range of hills that encircles the scanty veil of human life is the horizon for the majority of its inhabitants on its ridges the common sun is born and departs from them the stars rise and touching them they vanish by the many even this range the natural limit and bulwark of the vale is but imperfectly known its higher ascents are too often hidden by mists and clouds from uncultivated swamps which few have courage or curiosity to penetrate to the multitude below these vapours appear now as the dark horns of terrific agents on which none may intrude with impunity and now all aglow with colours not their own they are gazed at as the splendid palaces of happiness and power but in all ages there have been a few who measuring and sounding the rivers of the vale at the feet of their furthest inaccessible falls have learned that the sources must be far higher and far inward a few who even in the level streams have detected elements which neither the vale itself nor the surrounding mountains contained or could supply how and whence to these thoughts these strong probabilities the ascertaining vision the intuitive knowledge may finally supervene can be learnt only by the fact i might oppose to the question the words with which plotinus opposes nature to answer a similar difficulty should any one interrogate her how she works if graciously she vouchsafe to listen and speak she will reply it behoves thee not to disquiet me with interrogatories but to understand in silence even as i am silent and work without words likewise in the fifth book of the fifth aeneid speaking of the highest in intuitive knowledge as distinguished from the discursive or in the language of wordsworth the vision and the faculty divine he says it is not lawful to inquire from whence it sprang as if it were a thing subject to place and motion for it neither approach hither nor again departs from hence to some other place but it either appears to us or it does not appear so that we ought not to pursue it with a view of detecting its secret source but to watch in quiet till it suddenly shines upon us preparing ourselves for the blessed spectacle as the eye waits patiently for the rising sun they and they only can acquire the philosophic imagination the sacred power of self-intuition who within themselves can interpret and understand the symbol that the wings of the air sylph are forming within the skin of the caterpillar those only who feel in their own spirits the same instinct which impels the chrysalis of the horned fly to leave room in its involucrum for antenna yet to come they know and feel that the potential works in them even as the actual works on them in short all the organs of sense are framed for a corresponding world of sense and we have it all the organs of spirit are framed for a correspondent world of spirit though the latter organs are not developed in all alike but they exist in all and their first appearance discloses itself in the moral being how else could it be that even worldlings not wholly debased will contemplate the man of simple and disinterested goodness with contradictory feelings of pity and respect poor man he is not made for this world oh herein they utter a prophecy of universal fulfilment for man must either rise or sink it is the essential mark of the true philosopher to rest satisfied with no imperfect light as long as the impossibility of attaining a fuller knowledge has not been demonstrated that the common consciousness itself will furnish proofs by its own direction that it is connected with master currents below the surface 
I shall merely assume as a postulate pro tempore. This having been granted, though but in expectation of the argument, I can safely deduce from it the equal truth of my former assertion, that philosophy cannot be intelligible to all, even of the most learned and cultivated classes. A system, the first principle of which it is to render the mind intuitive of the spiritual in man, i.e. of that which lies on the other side of our natural consciousness, must needs have a great obscurity for those who have never disciplined and strengthened this ulterior consciousness. It must in truth be a land of darkness, a perfect anti-Goshen, for men to whom the noblest treasures of their own being are reported only through the imperfect translation of lifeless and sightless motions, perhaps in great part through words which are but the shadows of notions, even as the notional understanding itself is but the shadowy abstraction of living and actual truth on the immediate which dwells in every man and on the original intuition or absolute affirmation of it which is likewise in every man but does not in every man rise into consciousness all the certainty of our knowledge depends and this becomes intelligible to no man by the ministry of mere words from without the medium by which spirits understand each other is not the surrounding air but the freedom which they possess in common as a common ethereal element of their being the tremulous reciprocations of which propagate themselves even to the inmost of the soul where the spirit of a man is not filled with the consciousness of freedom, were it only from its restlessness, as of one still struggling in bondage, all spiritual intercourse is interrupted, not only with others, but even with himself. No wonder, then, that he remains incomprehensible to himself as well as to others. No wonder that, in the fearful desert of his consciousness, he wearies himself out with empty words, to which no friendly echo answers, either from his own heart or the heart of a fellow-being or bewilders himself in the pursuit of notional phantoms, the mere refractions from unseen and distant truths through the distorting medium of his own unenlivened and stagnant understanding. To remain unintelligible to such a mind, exclaimed Schelling on a like occasion, is honour and a good name before God and man. The history of philosophy, the same writer observes, contains instances of systems which for successive generations have remained enigmatic, such he deems the system of Leibniz, whom another writer, rashly i think and invidiously extols as the only philosopher who was himself deeply convinced of his own doctrines as hitherto interpreted however they have not produced the effect which leibnitz himself in a most instructive passage describes as the criterion of a true philosophy namely that it would at once explain and collect the fragments of truth scattered through systems apparently the most incongruous the truth says he is diffused more widely than is commonly believed but it is often painted yet oftener masked and is sometimes mutilated and sometimes alas in close alliance with mischievous errors the deeper however we penetrate into the ground of things the more truth we discover in the doctrines of the greater number of the philosophical sects the want of substantial reality in the objects of the senses according to the sceptics the harmonies or numbers the prototypes and ideas to which the pythagoreans and platonists reduced all things the one and all of parmenides and plotinus without spinozism the necessary connection of things according to the stoics reconcilable with the spontaneity of the other schools the vital philosophy of the cabalists and hermetists who assume the universality of sensation the substantial forms and entelechies of aristotle and the schoolmen together with the mechanical solution of all particular phenomena according to democritus and the recent philosophers all these we shall find united in one perspective central point which shows regularity and a coincidence of all the parts in the very object which from every other point of view must appear confused and distorted the spirit of sectarianism has been hitherto our fault and the cause of our failures we have imprisoned our own conceptions by the lines which we have drawn in order to exclude the conceptions of others je trouve que la plupart des sectes ont raison dans une bonne partie de ce qu'elle avance mais non pas tant en ce qu'elle nie a system which aims to deduce the memory with all the other functions of intelligence must of course place its first position from beyond the memory and anterior to it otherwise the principle of solution would be itself a part of the problem to be solved such a position therefore must in the first instance be demanded and the first question will be by what right is it demanded on this account i think it expedient to make some preliminary remarks on the introduction of postulates in philosophy the word postulate is borrowed from the science of mathematics in geometry the primary construction is not demonstrated but postulated this first and most simple construction in space is the point in motion or the line whether the point is moved in one and the same direction or whether its direction is continually changed remains as yet undetermined but if the direction of the point have been determined it is either by a point without it and then there arises the straight line which encloses no space or the direction of the point is not determined by a point without it 
and then it must flow back again on itself that is there arises a cyclical line which does enclose a space if the straight line be assumed as the positive the cyclical is then the negation of the straight it is a line which at no point strikes out into the straight but changes its direction continuously but if the primary line be conceived as undetermined and the straight line as determined throughout then the cyclical is the third compounded of both it is at once undetermined and determined undetermined through any point without and determined through itself geometry therefore supplies philosophy with the example of a primary intuition from which every science that lays claim to evidence must take its commencement the mathematician does not begin with a demonstrable proposition but with an intuition a practical idea but here an important distinction presents itself philosophy is employed on objects of the inner sense and cannot like geometry appropriate to every construction a correspondent outward intuition nevertheless philosophy if it is to arrive at evidence must proceed from the most original construction and the question then is what is the most original construction or first productive act for the inner sense the answer to this question depends on the direction which is given to the inner sense but in philosophy the inner sense cannot have its direction determined by an outward object to the original construction of the line i can be compelled by a line drawn before me on the slate or on sand the stroke thus drawn is indeed not the line itself but only the image or picture of the line it is not from it that we first learn to know the line but on the contrary we bring this stroke to the original line generated by the act of the imagination otherwise we could not define it as without breadth or thickness still however this stroke is the sensuous image of the original or ideal line and an efficient mean to excite every imagination to the intuition of it it is demanded then whether there be found any means in philosophy to determine the direction of the inner sense as in mathematics it is determinable by its specific image or outward picture now the inner sense has its direction determined for the greater part only by an act of freedom one man's consciousness extends only to the pleasant or unpleasant sensations caused in him by external impressions another enlarges his inner sense to a consciousness of forms and quantity a third in addition to the image is conscious of the conception or notion of the thing a fourth attains to a notion of his notions he reflects on his own reflections and thus we may say without impropriety that the one possesses more or less inner sense than the other this more or less betrays already that philosophy in its first principles must have a practical or moral as well as a theoretical or speculative side this difference in degree does not exist in the mathematics socrates in plato shows that an ignorant slave may be brought to understand and of himself to solve the most difficult geometrical problem socrates drew the figures for the slave in the sand the disciples of the critical philosophy could likewise as was indeed actually done by la forge and some other followers of descartes represent the origin of our representations in copper plates but no one has yet attempted it and it would be utterly useless to an eskimo or new zealander our most popular philosophy would be wholly unintelligible the sense the inward organ for it is not yet born in him so is there many a one among us yes and some who think themselves philosophers too to whom the philosophic organ is entirely wanting to such a man philosophy is a mere play of words and notions like a theory of music to the deaf or like the geometry of light to the blind the connection of the parts and their logical dependencies may be seen and remembered but the whole is groundless and hollow unsustained by living contact unaccompanied with any realizing intuition which exists by and in the act that affirms its existence which is known because it is and is because it is known the words of plotinus in the assumed person of nature hold true of the philosophic energy to theoron mu theorema poi osper oi geometrai theorontes graphosin alemon me graphusis theorusis de ufistantai aiton somaton grammai with me the act of contemplation makes the thing contemplated as the geometricians contemplating describe lines correspondent but i not describing lines but simply contemplating the representative forms of things rise up into existence the postulate of philosophy and at the same time the test of philosophic capacity is no other than the heaven descended know thyself a silo descended know thee seoton and this at once practically and speculatively for as philosophy is neither a science of the reason or understanding only nor merely a science of morals but the science of being altogether its primary ground can be neither merely speculative nor merely practical but both in one all knowledge rests on the coincidence of an object with a subject my readers have been warned in a former chapter that for their convenience as well as the writers the term subject is used by me in its scholastic sense as equivalent to mind or sentient being 
and as a necessary correlative of object or quicquid objicitur menti for we can know that only which is true and the truth is universally placed in the coincidence of the thought with the thing of the representation with the object represented now the sum of all that is merely objective we will henceforth call nature confining the term to its passive and material sense as comprising all the phenomena by which its existence is made known to us on the other hand the sum of all that is subjective we may comprehend in the name of the self or intelligence both conceptions are in necessary antithesis intelligence is conceived of as exclusively representative nature as exclusively represented the one as conscious the other as without consciousness now in all acts of positive knowledge there is required a reciprocal concurrence of both namely of the conscious being and of that which is in itself unconscious our problem is to explain this concurrence its possibility and its necessity during the act of knowledge itself the objective and subjective are so instantly united that we cannot determine to which of the two the priority belongs there is here no first and no second both are co-instantaneous and one while i am attempting to explain this intimate coalition i must suppose it dissolved i must necessarily set out from the one to which therefore i give hypothetical antecedents in order to arrive at the other but as there are but two factors or elements in the problem subject and object and as it is left indeterminate from which of them i should commence there are two cases equally possible one either the objective is taken as the first and then we have to account for the supervention of the subjective which coalesces with it the notion of the subjective is not contained in the notion of the objective on the contrary they mutually exclude each other the subjective therefore must supervene to the objective the conception of nature does not apparently involve the co-presence of an intelligence making an ideal duplicate of it that is representing it this desk for instance would according to our natural notions be though there should exist no sentient being to look at it this then is the problem of natural philosophy it assumes the objective or unconscious nature as the first and as therefore to explain how intelligence can supervene to it or how itself can grow into intelligence if it should appear that all enlightened naturalists without having distinctly proposed the problem to themselves have yet constantly moved in the line of its solution it must afford a strong presumption that the problem itself is founded in nature for if all knowledge has as it were two poles reciprocally required and presupposed all sciences must proceed from the one or the other and must tend toward the opposite as far as the equatorial point in which both are reconciled and become identical the necessary tendency therefore of all natural philosophy is from nature to intelligence and this and no other is the true ground and occasion of the instinctive striving to introduce theory into our views of natural phenomena the highest perfection of natural philosophy would consist in the perfect spiritualization of all the laws of nature into laws of intuition and intellect the phenomena the material must wholly disappear and the laws alone the formal must remain thence it comes that in nature itself the more the principle of law breaks forth the more does the husk drop off the phenomena themselves become more spiritual and at length cease altogether in our consciousness the optical phenomena are but a geometry the lines of which are drawn by light and the materiality of this light itself has already become matter of doubt in the appearances of magnetism all trace of matter is lost and of the phenomena of gravitation which not a few among the most illustrious newtonians have declared no otherwise comprehensible than as an immediate spiritual influence there remains nothing but its law the execution of which on a vast scale is the mechanism of the heavenly motions the theory of natural philosophy would then be completed when all nature was demonstrated to be identical in essence with that which in its highest known power exists in man as intelligence and self-consciousness when the heavens and the earth shall declare not only the power of their maker but the glory and the presence of their god even as he appeared to the great prophet during the vision of the mount in the skirts of his divinity this may suffice to show that even natural science which commences with the material phenomenon as the reality and substance of things existing does yet by the necessity of theorizing unconsciously and as it were instinctively end in nature as an intelligence and by this tendency the science of nature becomes finally natural philosophy the one of the two poles of fundamental science two or the subjective is taken as the first and the problem then is how there supervenes to it a coincident objective in the pursuit of these sciences our success in each depends on an austere and faithful adherence to its own principles with a careful separation and exclusion of those which appertain to the opposite science as the natural philosopher who directs his views to the objective 
avoids above all things the intermixture of the subjective in his knowledge as for instance arbitrary suppositions or rather sufflictions occult qualities spiritual agents and the substitution of final for efficient causes so on the other hand the transcendental or intelligential philosopher is equally anxious to preclude all interpolation of the objective into the subjective principles of his science as for instance the assumption of impresses or configurations in the brain correspondent to miniature pictures on the retina painted by rays of light from supposed originals which are not the immediate and real objects of vision but deductions from it for the purposes of explanation this purification of the mind is effected by an absolute and scientific scepticism to which the mind voluntarily determines itself for the specific purpose of future certainty descartes who in his meditations himself first at least of the moderns gave a beautiful example of this voluntary doubt this self-determined indetermination happily expresses its utter difference from the scepticism of vanity or irreligion nec tamen in scepticos imitaba qui dubitant tantum ut dubitent et praeta incertitudinem ipsam nihil quirent nam contra totus in eo eram ut aliquid certi reperirem nor is it less distinct in its motives and final aim than in its proper objects which are not as in ordinary scepticism the prejudices of education and circumstance but those original and innate prejudices which nature herself has planted in all men and which to all but the philosopher are the first principles of knowledge and the final test of truth now these essential prejudices are all reducible to the one fundamental presumption that there exist things without us as this on the one hand originates neither in grounds nor arguments and yet on the other hand remains proof against all attempts to remove it by grounds or arguments naturam foca expellas tamen usque redibit on the one hand lays claim to immediate certainty as a position at once indemonstrable and irresistible and yet on the other hand inasmuch as it refers to something essentially different from ourselves nay even in opposition to ourselves leaves it inconceivable how it could possibly become a part of our immediate consciousness in other words how that which ex hypothesi is and continues to be extrinsic and alien to our being should become a modification of our being the philosopher therefore compels himself to treat this faith as nothing more than a prejudice innate indeed and connatural but still a prejudice the other position which not only claims but necessitates the admission of its immediate certainty equally for the scientific reason of the philosopher as for the common sense of mankind at large namely i am cannot so properly be entitled a prejudice it is groundless indeed but then in the very idea it precludes all ground and separated from the immediate consciousness loses its whole sense and import it is groundless but only because it is itself the ground of all other certainty now the apparent contradiction that the former position namely the existence of things without us which from its nature cannot be immediately certain should be received as blindly and as independently of all grounds as the existence of our own being the transcendental philosopher can solve only by the supposition that the former is unconsciously involved in the latter that it is not only coherent but identical and one and the same thing with our own immediate self-consciousness to demonstrate this identity is the office and object of his philosophy if it be said that this is idealism let it be remembered that it is only so far idealism as it is at the same time and on that very account the truest and most binding realism for wherein does the realism of mankind properly consist in the assertion that there exists a something without them what or how or where they know not which occasions the objects of their perception oh no this is neither connatural nor universal it is what a few have taught and learned in the schools and which the many repeat without asking themselves concerning their own meaning the realism common to all mankind is far elder and lies infinitely deeper than this hypothetical explanation of the origin of our perceptions an explanation skimmed from the mere surface of mechanical philosophy it is the table itself which the man of common sense believes himself to see not the phantom of a table from which he may argumentatively deduce the reality of a table which he does not see if to destroy the reality of all that we actually behold be idealism what can be more egregiously so than the system of modern metaphysics which banishes us to a land of shadows surrounds us with apparitions and distinguishes truth from illusion only by the majority of those who dream the same dream i asserted that the world was mad exclaimed poor lee and the world said that i was mad and confound them they outvoted me it is to the true and original realism that i would direct the attention this believes and requires neither more nor less than the object which it beholds or presents to itself is the real and very object 
in this sense however much we may strive against it we are all collectively born idealists and therefore and only therefore are we at the same time realists but of this the philosophers of the schools know nothing or despise the faith as the prejudice of the ignorant vulgar because they live and move in a crowd of phrases and notions from which human nature has long ago vanished o oh, ye that reverence yourselves and walk humbly with the divinity in your own hearts ye are worthy of a better philosophy let the dead bury the dead but do you preserve your human nature the depth of which was never yet fathomed by a philosophy made up of notions and mere logical entities in the third treatise of my logosophia announced at the end of this volume i shall give deo valente the demonstrations and constructions of the dynamic philosophy scientifically arranged it is according to my conviction no other than the system of pythagoras and of plato revived and purified from impure mixtures doctrina per tot manus tradita tandem in vapen desiet the science of arithmetic furnishes instances that a rule may be useful in practical application and for the particular purpose may be sufficiently authenticated by the result before it has itself been fully demonstrated it is enough if only it be rendered intelligible this will i trust have been effected in the following theses for those of my readers who are willing to accompany me through the following chapter in which the results will be applied to the deduction of the imagination and with it the principles of production and of genial criticism in the fine arts thesis one truth is correlative to being knowledge without a correspondent reality is no knowledge if we know there must be somewhat known by us to know is in its very essence a verb active thesis two all truth is either mediate that is derived from some other truth or truths or immediate and original the latter is absolute and its formula a a the former is of dependent or conditional certainty and represented in the formula b a the certainty which adheres in a is attributable to b scholium a chain without a staple from which all the links derive their stability or a series without a first has been not inaptly allegorized as a string of blind men each holding the skirt of the man before him reaching far out of sight but all moving without the least deviation in one straight line it would be naturally taken for granted that there was a guide at the head of the file what if it were answered no sir the men are without number and infinite blindness supplies the place of sight equally inconceivable is the cycle of equal truths without a common and central principle which prescribes to each its proper sphere in the system of science that the absurdity does not so immediately strike us that it does not seem equally unimaginable is owing to a surreptitious act of the imagination which instinctively and without our noticing the same not only fills up the intervening spaces and contemplates the cycle of b c d e f etc as a continuous circle a giving to all collectively the unity of their common orbit but likewise supplies by a sort of sub intelligitur the one central power which renders the movement harmonious and cyclical thesis three we are to seek therefore for some absolute truth capable of communicating to other positions a certainty which it has not itself borrowed a truth self-grounded unconditional and known by its own light in short we have to find a somewhat which is simply because it is in order to be such it must be one which is its own predicate so far at least that all other nominal predicates must be modes and repetitions of itself its existence too must be such as to preclude the possibility of requiring a cause or antecedent without an absurdity thesis four that there can be but one such principle may be proved a priori for were there two or more each must refer to some other by which its equality is affirmed consequently neither would be self-established as the hypothesis demands and a posteriori it will be proved by the principle itself when it is discovered as involving universal antecedents in its very conception scholium if we affirm of a board that it is blue the predicate blue is accidental and not implied in the subject board if we affirm of a circle that it is equiradial the predicate indeed is implied in the definition of the subject but the existence of the subject itself is contingent and supposes both a cause and a percipient the same reasoning will apply to the indefinite number of supposed indemonstrable truths exempted from the profane approach of philosophic investigation by the amiable beatty and other less eloquent and not more profound inaugurators of common sense on the throne of philosophy a fruitless attempt were it only that it is the twofold function of philosophy to reconcile reason with common sense and to elevate common sense into reason thesis five such a principle cannot be any thing or object each thing is what it is in consequence of some other thing an infinite independent thing is no less a contradiction 
than an infinite circle or a sideless triangle besides a thing is that which is capable of being an object which itself is not the sole percipient but an object is inconceivable without a subject as its antithesis omne perceptum percipientum upon it but neither can the principle be found in a subject as a subject contradistinguished from an object for uniquique percipienti aliquid objicito perceptum it is to be found therefore neither in object nor subject taken separately and consequently as no other third is conceivable it must be found in that which is neither subject nor object exclusively but which is the identity of both thesis six this principle and so characterized manifests itself in the sum or i am which i shall hereafter indiscriminately express by the words spirit self and self-consciousness in this and in this alone object and subject being and knowing are identical each involving and supposing the other in other words it is a subject which becomes a subject by the act of constructing itself objectively to itself but which never is an object except for itself and only so far as by the very same act it becomes a subject it may be described therefore as a perpetual self-duplication of one and the same power into object and subject which presuppose each other and can exist only as antitheses scholium if a man be asked how he knows that he is he can only answer sum quia sum but if the absoluteness of this certainty having been admitted he be again asked how he the individual person came to be then in relation to the ground of his existence not to the ground of his knowledge of that existence he might reply sum quia deus est or still more philosophically sum quia in deo sum but if we elevate our conception to the absolute self the great eternal i am then the principle of being and of knowledge of idea and of reality the ground of existence and the ground of the knowledge of existence are absolutely identical sum quia sum i am because i affirm myself to be i affirm myself to be because i am thesis seven if then i know myself only through myself it is contradictory to require any other predicate of self but that of self-consciousness only in the self-consciousness of a spirit is there the required identity of object and of representation for herein consists the essence of a spirit that it is self-representative if therefore this be the one only immediate truth in the certainty of which the reality of our collective knowledge is grounded it must follow that the spirit in all the objects which it views views only itself if this could be proved the immediate reality of all intuitive knowledge would be assured it has been shown that a spirit is that which is its own object yet not originally an object but an absolute subject for which all itself included may become an object it must therefore be an act for every object is as an object dead fixed incapable in itself of any action and necessarily finite again the spirit originally the identity of object and subject must in some sense dissolve this identity in order to be conscious of it fit alter et idem but this implies an act and it follows therefore that intelligence or self-consciousness is impossible except by and in a will the self-conscious spirit therefore is a will and freedom must be assumed as a ground of philosophy and can never be deduced from it thesis eight whatever in its origin is objective is likewise as such necessarily finite therefore since a spirit is not originally an object and as a subject exists in antithesis to an object the spirit cannot originally be finite but neither can it be a subject without becoming an object and as it is originally the identity of both it can be conceived neither as infinite nor finite exclusively but as the most original union of both in the existence in the reconciling and the recurrence of this contradiction consists the process and mystery of production and life thesis nine this principium commune essendi et cognoscendi as subsisting in a will or primary act of self-duplication is the mediate or indirect principle of every science but it is the immediate and direct principle of the ultimate science alone i e of transcendental philosophy alone for it must be remembered that all these theses refer solely to one of the two polar sciences namely to that which commences with and rigidly confines itself within the subjective leaving the objective as far as it is exclusively objective to natural philosophy which is its opposite pole in its very idea therefore as a systematic knowledge of our collective knowing scientia scientiae it involves the necessity of some one highest principle of knowing as at once the source and accompanying form in all particular acts of intellect and perception this it has been shown can be found only in the act and evolution of self-consciousness we are not investigating an absolute principium essendi for then i admit many valid objections might be started against our theory 
but an absolute principium cognoscendi the result of both the sciences or the equatorial point would be the principle of a total and undivided philosophy as for prudential reasons i have chosen to anticipate in the scholium to thesis six and the notes subjoined in other words philosophy would pass into religion and religion become inclusive of philosophy we begin with the i know myself in order to end with the absolute i am we proceed from the self in order to lose and find all self in god thesis ten the transcendental philosopher does not inquire what ultimate ground of our knowledge there may lie out of our knowing but what is the last in our knowing itself beyond which we cannot pass the principle of our knowing is sought within the sphere of our knowing it must be something therefore which can itself be known it is asserted only that the act of self-consciousness is for us the source and principle of all our possible knowledge whether abstracted from us there exists anything higher and beyond this primary self-knowing which is for us the form of all our knowing must be decided by the result that the self-consciousness is the fixed point to which for us all is mortised and annexed needs no further proof but that the self-consciousness may be the modification of a higher form of being perhaps of a higher consciousness and this again of a yet higher and so on in an infinite regresses in short that self-consciousness may be itself something explicable into something which must lie beyond the possibility of our knowledge because the whole synthesis of our intelligence is first formed in and through the self-consciousness does not at all concern us as transcendental philosophers for to us self-consciousness is not a kind of being but a kind of knowing and that too the highest and furthest that exists for us it may however be shown and has in part already been shown earlier that even when the objective is assumed as the first we yet can never pass beyond the principle of self-consciousness should we attempt it we must be driven back from ground to ground each of which would cease to be a ground the moment we pressed on it we must be whirled down the gulf of an infinite series but this would make our reason baffle the end and purpose of all reason namely unity and system or we must break off the series arbitrarily and affirm an absolute something that is in and of itself at once cause and effect causa sui subject and object or rather the absolute identity of both but as this is inconceivable except in a self-consciousness it follows that even as natural philosophers we must arrive at the same principle from which as transcendental philosophers we set out that is in a self-consciousness in which the principium ascendi does not stand to the principium cognoscende in the relation of cause to effect but both the one and the other are co-inherent and identical thus the true system of natural philosophy places the sole reality of things in an absolute which is at once causa sui et effectus pate autopator vios heutu in the absolute identity of subject and object which it calls nature and which in its highest power is nothing else than self-conscious will or intelligence in this sense the position of malebranche that we see all things in god is a strict philosophical truth and equally true is the assertion of hobbes of hartley and of their masters in ancient greece that all real knowledge supposes a prior sensation for sensation itself is but vision nascent not the cause of intelligence but intelligence itself revealed as an earlier power in the process of self-construction maka ilathimoi peter ilathimoi e paracosmon e paramoiran tonson ethigon bearing then this in mind that intelligence is a self-development not a quality supervening to a substance we may abstract from all degree and for the purpose of philosophic construction reduce it to kind under the idea of an indestructible power with two opposite and counteracting forces which by a metaphor borrowed from astronomy we may call the centrifugal and centripetal forces the intelligence in the one tends to objectize itself and in the other to know itself in the object it will be hereafter my business to construct by a series of intuitions the progressive schemes that must follow from such a power with such forces till i arrive at the fullness of the human intelligence for my present purpose i assume such a power as my principle in order to deduce from it a faculty the generation agency and application of which form the contents of the ensuing chapter in a preceding page i have justified the use of technical terms in philosophy whenever they tend to preclude confusion of thought and when they assist the memory by the exclusive singleness of their meaning more than they may for a short time bewilder the attention by their strangeness i trust that i have not extended this privilege beyond the grounds on which i have claimed it namely the conveniency of the scholastic phrase to distinguish the kind from all degrees or rather to express the kind with the abstraction of degree as for instance multeity instead of multitude 
or secondly for the sake of correspondence in sound in interdependent or antithetical terms as subject and object or lastly to avoid the wearying recurrence of circumlocutions and definitions thus i shall venture to use potence in order to express a specific degree of a power in imitation of the algebraists i have even hazarded the new verb potentiate with its derivatives in order to express the combination or transfer of powers it is with new or unusual terms as with privileges in courts of justice or legislature there can be no legitimate privilege where there already exists a positive law adequate to the purpose and when there is no law in existence the privilege is to be justified by its accordance with the end or final cause of all law unusual and new coined words are doubtless an evil but vagueness confusion and imperfect conveyance of our thoughts are far greater every system which is under the necessity of using terms not familiarized by the metaphysics in fashion will be described as written in an unintelligible style and the author must expect the charge of having substituted learned jargon for clear conception while according to the creed of our modern philosophers nothing is deemed a clear conception but what is representable by a distinct image thus the conceivable is reduced within the bounds of the picturable hinc patet qui fiat ut cum irrepresentabile et impossibile vulgo eustem significatus habeanto conceptus tam continui quam infiniti a plurimus regicianto quippe quorum secundum leges cognitionis intuitivae representatio es impossibilis quenquam autem harum e non paucis scholis explosarum notionum praesertim prioris causam hic non gero maxmi tamen momendi erit monuese gravissimo illos errore labi qui tam perverse argumentandi ratione utuntur quid quid enim repugnat legibus intellectus et rationis utique as impossibile quod autem cum rationis puri sit objectum legibus cognitionis intuitivae tantum modo non subes non item non hic dissensus inter facultatem sensitivam et intellectualem quarum indolem mox exponam nihil indigita nisi quas mens ab intellectu acceptas fert ideas abstractas ilas in concreta exequi et in intuitus commentare saepe numero non posse haec autem reluctantia subjectiva mentito ut plurimum repugnantiam adequam objectivam et in cautos facile fallit limitibus quibus mens humana circumscribitu pro is habitis quibus ipsa rerum essentia continetur critics who are most ready to bring this charge of pedantry and unintelligibility are the most apt to overlook the important fact that besides the language of words there is the language of spirits sermo interior and that the former is only the vehicle of the latter consequently their assurance that they do not understand the philosophic writer instead of proving anything against the philosophy may furnish an equal and ceteris paribus even a stronger presumption against their own philosophic talent great indeed are the obstacles which an english metaphysician has to encounter amongst his most respectable and intelligent judges there will be many who have devoted their attention exclusively to the concerns and interests of human life and who bring with them to the perusal of a philosophic system an habitual aversion to all speculations the utility and application of which are not evident and immediate to these i would in the first instance merely oppose an authority which they themselves hold venerable that of lord bacon non inutile scientiae existimandae sunt quarum in se nullus as usus si ingenia acuant et ordinent there are others whose prejudices are still more formidable inasmuch as they are grounded in their moral feelings and religious principles which had been alarmed and shocked by the impious and pernicious tenets defended by hume priestley and the french fatalists or necessitarians some of whom had perverted metaphysical reasonings to the denial of the mysteries and indeed of all the peculiar doctrines of christianity and others even to the subversion of all distinction between right and wrong i would request such men to consider what an eminent and successful defender of the christian faith has observed that true metaphysics are nothing else but true divinity and that in fact the writers who have given them such just offence were sophists who had taken advantage of the general neglect into which the science of logic has unhappily fallen rather than metaphysicians a name indeed which those writers were the first to explode as unmeaning secondly i would remind them that as long as there are men in the world to whom the nothi seoten is an instinct and a command from their own nature so long will there be metaphysicians and metaphysical speculations that false metaphysics can be effectually counteracted by true metaphysics alone and that if the reasoning be clear solid and pertinent the truth deduced can never be the less valuable on account of the depth from which it may have been drawn 
a third class profess themselves friendly to metaphysics and believe that they are themselves metaphysicians they have no objection to system or terminology provided it be the method and the nomenclature to which they have been familiarized in the writings of locke hume hartley condiac or perhaps dr reed and professor stewart to objections from this cause it is a sufficient answer that one main object of my attempt was to demonstrate the vagueness or insufficiency of the terms used in the metaphysical schools of france and great britain since the revolution and that the errors which i propose to attack cannot subsist except as they are concealed behind the mask of a plausible and indefinite nomenclature but the worst and widest impediment still remains it is the predominance of a popular philosophy at once the counterfeit and the mortal enemy of all true and manly metaphysical research it is that corruption introduced by certain immethodical aphorisming eclectics who dismissing not only all system but all logical connection pick and choose whatever is most plausible and showy who select whatever words can have some semblance of sense attached to them without the least expenditure of thought in short whatever may enable men to talk of what they do not understand with a careful avoidance of everything that might awaken them to a moment's suspicion of their ignorance this alas is an irremediable disease for it brings with it not so much an indisposition to any particular system but an utter loss of taste and faculty for all system and for all philosophy like echoes that beget each other amongst the mountains the praise or blame of such men rolls and volleys long after the report from the original blunderbuss sequacitas as potius et coitio quam consensus et tamen quod pessimum est pusillanimitas ista non sine arrogantia et fastidio se offert i shall now proceed to the nature and genesis of the imagination but i must first take leave to notice that after a more accurate perusal of mr wordsworth's remarks on the imagination in his preface to the new edition of his poems i find that my conclusions are not so consentient with his as i confess i had taken for granted in an article contributed by me to mr southey's omniana on the soul and its organs of sense are the following sentences these the human faculties i would arrange under the different senses and powers as the eye the ear the touch etc the imitative power voluntary and automatic the imagination or shaping and modifying power the fancy or the aggregative and associative power the understanding or the regulative substantiating and realizing power the speculative reason viz theoretica et scientifica or the power by which we produce or aim to produce unity necessity and universality in all our knowledge by means of principles a priori the will or practical reason the faculty of choice germanice willkür and distinct both from the moral will and the choice the sensation of volition which i found reason to include under the head of single and double touch to this as far as it relates to the subject in question namely the words the aggregative and associative power mr wordsworth's objection is only that the definition is too general to aggregate and to associate to evoke and to combine belong as well to the imagination as to the fancy i reply that if by the power of evoking and combining mr wordsworth means the same as and no more than i meant by the aggregative and associative i continue to deny that it belongs at all to the imagination and i am disposed to conjecture that he has mistaken the co-presence of fancy with imagination for the operation of the latter singly a man may work with two very different tools at the same moment each has its share in the work but the work effected by each is distinct and different but it will probably appear in the next chapter that deeming it necessary to go back much further than mr wordsworth's subject required or permitted i have attached a meaning to both fancy and imagination which he had not in view at least while he was writing that preface he will judge would to heaven i might meet with many such readers i will conclude with the words of bishop jeremy taylor he to whom all things are one who draweth all things to one and seeth all things in one may enjoy true peace and rest of spirit end of chapter twelve Chapter Thirteen of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Chapter Thirteen. On the Imagination or Esemplastic Power. O Adam, one Almighty is, from whom all things proceed and up to Him return, if not depraved from good 
created all such to perfection one first matter all endued with various forms various degrees of substance and in things that live of life but more refined more spiritous and pure as nearer to him placed or nearer tending each in their several active spheres assigned till body up to spirit work in bound proportion to each kind so from the root springs lighter the green stalk from thence the leaves more airy last the bright consummate flower spirits odorous breathes flowers and their fruit man's nourishment by gradual scale sublimed to vital spirits aspire to animal to intellectual give both life and sense fancy and understanding whence the soul reason receives and reason is her being discursive or intuitive sane dicerentur si res corporalis nil nisi materiale continerent verissime influxu consistere neque habere substantiali quicquam quem admodum at platonici olim recte agnovere inc igitur praeter pure mathematica et phantasiae subjecta collegi quaedam metaphysica solaque mente perceptibilia esse admitenda et massae materiali principium quadam superius et ut sic dicam formale addendum quando quidem omnes veritates rerum corporearum ex solis axiomatibus logisticis et geometricis nempe de magno et parvo toto et parte figura et situ collegi non possint sed alia de causa et effectu actioneque et passione accedere debeant quibus ordinis rerum ratione salventur et principium rerum an antilicean an vim appellimus non refert modo memenerimus per solam virium notionem intelligibiliter explicari sebo mai noerum crufian taxin corri ti meson u catechuthin descartes speaking as a naturalist and in imitation of archimedes said give me matter and motion and i will construct you the universe we must of course understand him to have meant i will render the construction of the universe intelligible in the same sense the transcendental philosopher says grant me a nature having two contrary forces the one of which tends to expand infinitely while the other strives to apprehend or find itself in this infinity and i will cause the world of intelligences with the whole system of their representations to rise up before you every other science presupposes intelligence as already existing and complete the philosopher contemplates it in its growth and as it were represents its history to the mind from its birth to its maturity the venerable sage of konigsberg has preceded the march of this master thought as an effective pioneer in his essay on the introduction of negative quantities into philosophy published seventeen sixty three in this he has shown that instead of assailing the science of mathematics by metaphysics as berkeley did in his analyst or of sophisticating it as wolf did by the vain attempt of deducing the first principles of geometry from supposed deeper grounds of ontology it behoved the metaphysician rather to examine whether the only province of knowledge which man has succeeded in erecting into a pure science might not furnish materials or at least hints for establishing and pacifying the unsettled warring and embroiled domain of philosophy an imitation of the mathematical method had indeed been attempted with no better success than attended the essay of david to wear the armour of saul another use however is possible and of far greater promise namely the actual application of the positions which had so wonderfully enlarged the discoveries of geometry mutatis mutandis to philosophical subjects kant having briefly illustrated the utility of such an attempt in the questions of space motion and infinitely small quantities as employed by the mathematician proceeds to the idea of negative quantities and the transfer of them to metaphysical investigation opposites he well observes are of two kinds either logical that is such as are absolutely incompatible or real without being contradictory the former he denominates nihil negativum irrepresentabile the connection of which produces nonsense a body in motion is something aliquid cogitabile but a body at one and the same time in motion and not in motion is nothing or at most air articulated into nonsense but a motory force of a body in one direction and an equal force of the same body in an opposite direction is not incompatible and the result namely rest is real and representable for the purposes of mathematical calculus it is indifferent which force we term negative and which positive and consequently we appropriate the latter to that which happens to be the principal object in our thoughts thus if a man's capital be ten and his debts eight the subtraction will be the same whether we call the capital negative debt or the debt negative capital but inasmuch as the latter stands practically in reference to the former we of course represent the sum as ten minus eight it is equally clear that two equal forces acting in opposite directions both being finite 
and each distinguished from the other by its direction only must neutralize or reduce each other to inaction now the transcendental philosophy demands first that two forces should be conceived which counteract each other by their essential nature not only not in consequence of the accidental direction of each but as prior to all direction nay as the primary forces from which the conditions of all possible directions are derivative and deducible secondly that these forces should be assumed to be both alike infinite both alike indestructible the problem will then be to discover the result or product of two such forces as distinguished from the result of those forces which are finite and derive their difference solely from the circumstance of their direction when we have formed a scheme or outline of these two different kinds of force and of their different results by the process of discursive reasoning it will then remain for us to elevate the thesis from notional to actual by contemplating intuitively this one power with its two inherent indestructible yet counteracting forces and the results or generations to which their interpenetration gives existence in the living principle and in the process of our own self-consciousness by what instrument this is possible the solution itself will discover at the same time that it will reveal to and for whom it is possible non omnia possumus omnes there is a philosophic no less than a poetic genius which is differenced from the highest perfection of talent not by degree but by kind the counteraction then of the two assumed forces does not depend on their meeting from opposite directions the power which acts in them is indestructible it is therefore inexhaustibly re ebullient and as something must be the result of these two forces both alike infinite and both alike indestructible and as rest or neutralization cannot be this result no other conception is possible but that the product must be a tertium aliquid or finite generation consequently this conception is necessary now this tertium aliquid can be no other than an interpenetration of the counteracting powers partaking of both thus far had the work been transcribed for the press when i received the following letter from a friend whose practical judgment i have had ample reason to estimate and revere and whose taste and sensibility preclude all the excuses which my self-love might possibly have prompted me to set up in plea against the decision of advisers of equal good sense but with less tact and feeling dear c you ask my opinion concerning your chapter on the imagination both as to the impressions it made on myself and as to those which i think it will make on the public i e that part of the public who from the title of the work and from its forming a sort of introduction to a volume of poems are likely to constitute the great majority of your readers as to myself in stating in the first place the effect on my understanding your opinions and method of argument were not only so new to me but so directly the reverse of all i had ever been accustomed to consider as truth that even if i had comprehended your premises sufficiently to have admitted them and had seen the necessity of your conclusions i should still have been in that state of mind which in your note in chapter four you have so ingeniously evolved as the antithesis to that in which a man is when he makes a ball in your own words i should have felt as if i had been standing on my head the effect on my feelings on the other hand i cannot better represent than by supposing myself to have known only our light airy modern chapels of ease and then for the first time to have been placed and left alone in one of our largest gothic cathedrals in a gusty moonlight night of autumn now in glimmer and now in gloom often in palpable darkness not without a chilly sensation of terror then suddenly emerging into broad yet visionary lights with coloured shadows of fantastic shapes yet all decked with holy insignia and mystic symbols and ever and anon coming out full upon pictures and stonework images of great men with whose names i was familiar but which looked upon me with countenances and an expression the most dissimilar to all i had been in the habit of connecting with those names those whom i had been taught to venerate as almost superhuman in magnitude of intellect i found perched in little fretwork niches as grotesque dwarfs while the grotesques in my hitherto belief stood guarding the high altar with all the characters of apotheosis in short what i had supposed substances were thinned away into shadows while everywhere shadows were deepened into substances if substance might be called that shadow seemed for each seemed either yet after all i could not but repeat the lines which you had quoted from a manuscript poem of your own in the friend and applied to a work of mr wordsworth's though with a few of the words altered an orphic tale indeed a tale obscure of high and passionate thoughts to a strange music chanted be assured however that i look forward anxiously to your great book on the constructive philosophy which you have promised and announced and that i will do my best to understand it only i will not promise to descend into the dark cave of trophonius with you there to rub my own eyes in order to make the sparks and figured flashes which i am required to see so much for myself but as for the public i do not hesitate a moment in advising and urging you to withdraw the chapter from the present work and to reserve it for your announced treatises on the logos or communicative intellect in man and deity first because imperfectly as i understand the present chapter 
I see clearly that you have done too much, and yet not enough. You have been obliged to omit so many links from the necessity of compression, that what remains looks, if I may recur to my former illustration, like the fragments of the winding steps of an old ruined tower. Secondly, a still stronger argument, at least one that I am sure will be more forcible with you, is, that your readers will have both right and reason to complain of you. This chapter, which cannot, when it is printed, amount to so little as an hundred pages, will of necessity greatly increase the expense of the work, and every reader who, like myself, is neither prepared nor perhaps calculated for the study of so abstruse a subject so abstrusely treated will, as I have before hinted, be almost entitled to accuse you of a sort of imposition on him, for who, he might truly observe, could from your title-page, to wit, my literary life and opinions, published too as introductory to a volume of miscellaneous poems, have anticipated or even conjectured a long treatise on ideal realism, which holds the same relation in abstruseness to Plotinus as Plotinus does to Plato. It will be well, if already you have not too much of metaphysical disquisition in your work, though as the larger part of the disquisition is historical, it will doubtless be both interesting and instructive to many to whose unprepared minds your speculations on the esamplastic power would be utterly unintelligible. Be assured, if you do publish this chapter in the present work, you will be reminded of Bishop Barclay's series, announced as an essay on tar-water, which, beginning with tar, ends with the trinity, the omne scibile forming the interspace, I say, in the present work. In that greater work to which you have devoted so many years, and study so intense and various, it will be in its proper place. Your prospectus will have described and announced both its contents and their nature, and if any persons purchase it who feel no interest in the subjects of which it treats, they will have themselves only to blame. I could add to these arguments one derived from pecuniary motives, and particularly from the probable effects on the sale of your present publication, but they would weigh little with you compared with the preceding. Besides, I have long observed that the arguments drawn from your own personal interests more often act on you as narcotics than as stimulants, and that in money concerns you have some small portion of pig-nature in your moral idiosyncrasy, and like these amiable creatures, must occasionally be pulled backward from the boat in order to make you enter it. All success attend you, for if hard thinking and hard reading are merits, you have deserved it. Your affectionate, etc. In consequence of this very judicious letter, which produced complete conviction on my mind, I shall content myself for the present with stating the main result of the chapter, which I have reserved for that future publication, a detailed prospectus of which the reader will find at the close of the second volume. The imagination, then, I consider either as primary or secondary. The primary imagination I hold to be the living power and prime agent of all human perception, and as a repetition in the finite mind of the eternal act of creation in the infinite I am. The secondary imagination I consider as an echo of the former, coexisting with the conscious will, yet still as identical with the primary in the kind of its agency, and differing only in degree, and in the mode of its operation. It dissolves, diffuses, dissipates, in order to recreate, or where this process is rendered impossible, yet still at all events it struggles to idealize and to unify. It is essentially vital, even as all objects, as objects, are essentially fixed and dead. Fancy, on the contrary, has no other counters to play with, but fixities and definites. The fancy is indeed no other than a mode of memory emancipated from the order of time and space, while it is blended with and modified by that empirical phenomenon of the will, which we express by the word choice. But equally with the ordinary memory, the fancy must receive all its materials ready-made from the law of association. End of chapter 13 Chapter fourteen of Biographia Literaria. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicole Lee. Biographia Literaria by Samuel Taylor Coleridge. Chapter fourteen. Occasion of the Lyrical Ballads and the Objects Originally Proposed. Preface to the Second Edition. The Ensuing Controversy Its Causes and Acrimony philosophic definitions of a poem and poetry with scholia during the first year that mr wordsworth and i were neighbours our conversations turned frequently on the two cardinal points of poetry the power of exciting the sympathy of the reader by a faithful adherence to the truth of nature and the power of giving the interest of novelty by the modifying colours of imagination the sudden charm which accidents of light and shade which moonlight or sunset diffused over a known and familiar landscape, appeared to represent the practicability of combining both. These are the poetry of nature. The thought suggested itself, 
to which of us I do not recollect, that a series of poems might be composed of two sorts. In the one, the incidents and agents were to be, in part at least, supernatural, and the excellence aimed at was to consist in the interesting of the affections by the dramatic truth of such emotions as would naturally accompany such situations, supposing them real, and real in this sense they have been to every human being who, from whatever source of delusion, has at any time believed himself under supernatural agency. For the second class, subjects were to be chosen from ordinary life. The characters and incidents were to be such as will be found in every village and its vicinity, where there is a meditative and feeling mind to seek after them or to notice them when they present themselves. In this idea originated the plan of the lyrical ballads, in which it was agreed that my endeavours should be directed to persons and characters supernatural, or at least romantic, yet so as to transfer from our inward nature a human interest and a semblance of truth sufficient to procure for these shadows of imagination that willing suspension of disbelief for the moment which constitutes poetic faith. Mr. Wordsworth, on the other hand, was to propose to himself as his object to give the charm of novelty to things of every day, and to excite a feeling analogous to the supernatural by awakening the mind's attention to the lethargy of custom, and directing it to the loveliness and the wonders of the world before us, an inexhaustible treasure, but for which, in consequence of the film of familiarity and selfish solicitude, we have eyes yet see not, ears that hear not, and hearts that neither feel nor understand. With this view I wrote The Ancient Mariner, and was preparing, among other poems, The Dark Lady and the Christabel, in which I should have more nearly realised my ideal than I had done in my first attempt. But Mr. Wordsworth's industry had proved so much more successful, and the number of his poems so much greater, that my compositions, instead of forming a balance, appeared rather an interpolation of heterogeneous matter. Mr. Wordsworth added two or three poems written in his own character, in the impassioned, lofty, and sustained diction which is characteristic of his genius. In this form the lyrical ballads were published, and were presented by him as an experiment, where the subjects, which from their nature rejected the usual ornaments, and extra-colloquial style of poems in general, might not be so managed, in the language of ordinary life, as to produce the pleasurable interest which it is the peculiar business of poetry to impart. To the second edition he added a preface of considerable length, in which, notwithstanding some passages of apparently a contrary import, he was understood to contend for the extension of this style to poetry of all kinds, and to reject as vicious and indefensible all phrases and forms of speech that were not included in what he, unfortunately, I think, adopting an equivocal expression, called the language of real life. From this preface, prefixed to poems in which it was impossible to deny the presence of original genius, however mistaken its direction might be deemed, arose the whole long-continued controversy. For from the conjunction of perceived power with supposed heresy, I explained the inveteracy, and in some instances I grieve to say, the acrimonious passions with which the controversy has been conducted by the assailants. Had Mr. Wordsworth's poems been the silly, the childish things, which they were for a long time described as being, had they been really distinguished from the compositions of other poets merely by meanness of language and inanity of thought, had they indeed contained nothing more than what is found in the parodies and pretended imitations of them, they must have sunk at once a dead weight into the slough of oblivion, and have dragged the preface along with them. But year after year increased the number of Mr. Wordsworth's admirers. They were found, too, not in the lower classes of the reading public, but chiefly among young men of strong sensibility and meditative minds, and their admiration, inflamed perhaps in some degree by opposition, was distinguished by its intensity, I might almost say, by its religious fervour. These facts, and the intellectual energy of the author, which was more or less consciously felt, where it was outwardly and even boisterously denied, meeting with sentiments of aversion to his opinions, and of alarm at their consequences, produced an eddy of criticism, which would of itself have borne up the poems, by the violence with which it whirled them round and round. With many parts of this preface in the sense attributed to them, and which the words undoubtedly seemed to authorise, I never concurred, but on the contrary objected to them as erroneous in principle, 
and as contradictory, in appearance at least, both to other parts of the same preface, and to the author's own practice in the greater part of the poems themselves. Mr. Wordsworth, in his recent collection, has, I find, degraded this prefatory disquisition to the end of his second volume, to be read, or not, at the reader's choice. But he has not, as far as I can discover, announced any change in his poetic creed. At all events, considering it as the source of a controversy, in which I have been honoured more than I deserve, by the frequent conjunction of my name with his. I think it expedient to declare once for all in what points I coincide with the opinion supported in that preface, and in what points I altogether differ. But in order to render myself intelligible, I must previously, in as few words as possible, explain my views, first, of a poem, and secondly, of poetry itself, in kind and in essence. The office of philosophical disquisition consists in just distinction while it is the privilege of the philosopher to preserve himself constantly aware that distinction is not division. In order to obtain adequate notions of any truth, we must intellectually separate its distinguishable parts, and this is the technical process of philosophy. But having so done, we must then restore them in our conceptions to the unity in which they actually coexist, and this is the result of philosophy. A poem contains the same elements as a prose composition, the difference, therefore, must consist in a different combination of them, in consequence of a different object being proposed. According to the difference of the object will be the difference of the combination. It is possible that the object may be merely to facilitate the recollection of any given facts or observations by artificial arrangement, and the composition will be a poem merely because it is distinguished from prose by metre or by rhyme or by both conjointly. In this the lower sense a man might attribute the name of a poem to the well-known enumeration of the days in the several months. Thirty days hath September, April, June, and November, etc., and others of the same class and purpose. And as a particular pleasure is found in anticipating the recurrence of sounds and quantities, all compositions that have this charm superadded, whatever be their contents, may be entitled poems. So much for the superficial form. A difference of object and content supplies an additional ground of distinction. The immediate purpose may be the communication of truths, either of truth absolute and demonstrable, as in works of science, or of facts experienced and recorded, as in history. Pleasure, and that of the highest and most permanent kind, may result from the attainment of the end, but it is not itself the immediate end. In other works, the communication of pleasure may be the immediate purpose, and though truth, either moral or intellectual, ought to be the ultimate end, yet this will distinguish the character of the author, not the class to which the work belongs. Blessed indeed is that state of society, in which the immediate purpose would be baffled by the perversion of the proper ultimate end, in which no charm of diction or imagery could exempt the bathylus even of an Anacreon or the Alexis of Virgil from disgust and aversion. But the communication of pleasure may be the immediate object of a work not metrically composed, and that object may have been in a high degree attained, as in novels and romances. Would then the mere superaddition of metre, with or without rhyme, entitle these to the name of poems? The answer is that nothing can permanently please, which does not contain in itself the reason why it is so, and not otherwise. If metre be superadded, all other parts must be made consonant with it. They must be such as to justify the perpetual and distinct attention to each part, which an exact correspondent recurrence of accent and sound are calculated to excite. The final definition, then, so deduced, may be thus worded. A poem is that species of composition which is opposed to works of science by proposing for its immediate object pleasure, not truth, and from all other species, having this object in common with it, it is discriminated, by proposing to itself such delight from the whole as is compatible with a distinct gratification from each component part. Controversy is not seldom excited in consequence of the disputants attaching each a different meaning to the same word, and in few instances has this been more striking than in disputes concerning the present subject. If a man chooses to call every composition a poem, which is rhyme or measure or both, I must leave his opinion uncontroverted, the distinction is at least competent to characterise the writer's intention. If it were subjoined, that the whole is likewise entertaining or affecting, 
as a tale or as a series of interesting reflections i of course admit this as another fit ingredient of a poem and an additional merit but if the definition sought for be that of a legitimate poem i answer it must be one the parts of which mutually support and explain each other all in their proportion harmonizing with and supporting the purpose and known influences of metrical arrangement the philosophic critics of all ages coincide with the ultimate judgment of all countries in equally denying the praises of a just poem on the one hand to a series of striking lines or diastitches each of which absorbing the whole attention of the reader to itself becomes disjoined from its context and forms a separate whole instead of a harmonizing part and on the other hand to an unsustained composition from which the reader collects rapidly the general result unattracted by the component parts the reader should be carried forward not merely or chiefly by the mechanical impulse of curiosity or by a restless desire to arrive at the final solution but by the pleasurable activity of mind excited by the attractions of the journey itself like the motion of a serpent which the egyptians made the emblem of intellectual power or like the path of sound through the air at every step he pauses and half recedes and from the retrogressive movement collects the force which again carries him onward precipitandus est liber spiritus says petronius most happily the epithet liber here balances the preceding verb and it is not easy to conceive more meaning condensed in fewer words but if this should be admitted as a satisfactory character of a poem we have still to seek for a definition of poetry the writings of plato and jeremy taylor and burnett's theory of the earth furnish undeniable proofs that poetry of the highest kind may exist without metre and even without the contradistinguishing objects of a poem the first chapter of isaiah indeed a very large portion of the whole book is poetry in the most emphatic sense yet it would be not less irrational than strange to assert that pleasure and not truth was the immediate object of the prophet in short whatever specific import we attach to the word poetry there will be found involved in it as a necessary consequence that a poem of any length neither can be nor ought to be all poetry yet if an harmonious whole is to be produced the remaining parts must be preserved in keeping with the poetry and this can be no otherwise effected than by such a studied selection and artificial arrangement as will partake of one though not a peculiar property of poetry and this again can be no other than the property of exciting a more continuous and equal attention than the language of prose aims at whether colloquial or written my own conclusions on the nature of poetry in the strictest use of the word have been in part anticipated in some of the remarks on the fancy and imagination in the early part of this work what is poetry is so nearly the same question with what is a poet that the answer to the one is involved in the solution of the other for it is a distinction resulting from the poetic genius itself which sustains and modifies the images thoughts and emotions of the poet's own mind the poet described in ideal perfection brings the whole soul of man into activity with the subordination of its faculties to each other according to their relative worth and dignity he diffuses a tone and spirit of unity that blends and as it were fuses each into each by that synthetic and magical power to which i would exclusively appropriate the name of imagination this power first put in action by the will and understanding and retained under their irremissive though gentle and unnoticed control laxis effeto habenis reveals itself in the balance or reconcilement of opposite or discordant qualities of sameness with difference of the general with the concrete the idea with the image the individual with the representative the sense of novelty and freshness with old and familiar objects a more than usual state of emotion with more than usual order judgment ever awake and steady self-possession with enthusiasm and feeling profound or vehement and while it blends and harmonizes the natural and the artificial still subordinates art to nature the manner to the matter and our admiration of the poet to our sympathy with the poetry doubtless as sir john davis observes of the soul and his words may with slight alteration be applied and even more appropriately to the poetic imagination doubtless this could not be but that she turns bodies to spirit by sublimation strange as fire converts to fire the things it burns as we our food into our nature change 
from their gross matter she abstracts their forms and draws a kind of quintessence from things which to her proper nature she transforms to bear them light on her celestial wings thus does she when from individual states she doth abstract the universal kinds which then reclothed in diverse names and fates steal access through the senses to our minds finally good sense is the body of poetic genius fancy its drapery motion its life and imagination the soul that is everywhere and in each and forms all into one graceful and intelligent whole end of chapter fourteen chapter fifteen of biographia literaria this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nicole lee biographia literaria by samuel taylor coleridge chapter fifteen the specific symptoms of poetic power elucidated in a critical analysis of shakespeare's venus and adonis and rape of lucrece in the application of these principles to purposes of practical criticism as employed in the appraisement of works more or less imperfect i have endeavoured to discover what the qualities in a poem are which may be deemed promises and specific symptoms of poetic power as distinguished from general talent determined to poetic composition by accidental motives by an act of the will rather than by the inspiration of a genial and productive nature in this investigation i could not i thought do better than keep before me the earliest work of the greatest genius that perhaps human nature has yet produced our myriad-minded shakespeare i mean the venus and adonis and the lucrece works which give at once strong promises of the strength and yet obvious proofs of the immaturity of his genius from these i abstracted the following marks as characteristics of original poetic genius in general one in the venus and adonis the first and most obvious excellence is the perfect sweetness of the versification its adaptation to the subject and the power displayed in varying the march of the words without passing into a loftier and more majestic rhythm than was demanded by the thoughts or permitted by the propriety of preserving a sense of melody predominant the delight in richness and sweetness of sound even to a faulty excess if it be evidently original and not the result of an easily imitable mechanism i regard as a highly favourable promise in the compositions of a young man the man that hath not music in his soul can indeed never be a genuine poet imagery even taken from nature much more when transplanted from books as travels voyages and works of natural history affecting incidents just thoughts interesting personal or domestic feelings and with these the art of their combination or intertexture in the form of a poem may all by incessant effort be acquired as a trade by a man of talent and much reading who as i once before observed has mistaken an intense desire of poetic reputation for a natural poetic genius the love of the arbitrary end for a possession of the peculiar means but the sense of musical delight with the power of producing it is a gift of imagination and this together with the power of reducing multitude into unity of effect and modifying a series of thoughts by some one predominant thought or feeling may be cultivated and improved but can never be learned it is in these that poeta nascitur non fit two a second promise of genius is the choice of subjects very remote from the private interests and circumstances of the writer himself at least i have found that where the subject is taken immediately from the author's personal sensations and experiences the excellence of a particular poem is but an equivocal mark and often a fallacious pledge of genuine poetic power we may perhaps remember the tale of the statuary who had acquired considerable reputation for the legs of his goddesses though the rest of the statue accorded but indifferently with ideal beauty till his wife elated by her husband's praises modestly acknowledged that she had been his constant model in the venus and adonis this proof of poetic power exists even to excess it is throughout as if a superior spirit more intuitive more intimately conscious even than the characters themselves not only of every outward look and act but of the flux and reflux of the mind in all its subtlest thoughts and feelings were placing the whole before our view himself meanwhile unparticipating in the passions and actuated only by that pleasurable excitement which had resulted from the energetic fervour of his own spirit in so vividly exhibiting what it had so accurately and profoundly contemplated i think i should have conjectured from these poems 
that even then the great instinct which impelled the poet to the drama was secretly working in him prompting him by a serious and never broken chain of imagery always vivid and because unbroken often minute by the highest effort of the picturesque in words of which words are capable higher perhaps than was ever realized by any other poet even dante not excepted to provide a substitute for that visual language that constant intervention and running comment by tone look and gesture which in his dramatic works he was entitled to expect from the players his venus and adonis seem at once the characters themselves and the whole representation of those characters by the most consummate actors you seem to be told nothing but to see and hear everything hence it is from the perpetual activity of attention required on the part of the reader from the rapid flow the quick change and the playful nature of the thoughts and images and above all from the alienation and if i may hazard such an expression the utter aloofness of the poet's own feelings from those of which he is at once the painter and the analyst that though the very subject cannot but detract from the pleasure of a delicate mind yet never was poem less dangerous on a moral account instead of doing as ariosto and as still more offensively wieland has done instead of degrading and deforming passion into appetite the trials of love into the struggles of concupiscence shakespeare has here represented the animal impulse itself so as to preclude all sympathy with it by dissipating the reader's notice among the thousand outward images and now beautiful now fanciful circumstances which form its dresses and its scenery or by diverting our attention from the main subject by those frequent witty or profound reflections which the poet's ever active mind has deduced from or connected with the imagery and the instance the reader is forced into too much action to sympathize with the merely passive of our nature as little can a mind thus roused and awakened be brooded on by mean and indistinct emotion as the low lazy mist can creep upon the surface of a lake while a strong gale is driving it onward in waves and billows three it has been before observed that images however beautiful though faithfully copied from nature and as accurately represented in words do not of themselves characterize the poet they become proofs of original genius only as far as they are modified by a predominant passion or by associated thoughts or images awakened by that passion or when they have the effect of reducing multitude to unity or succession to an instant or lastly when a human and intellectual life is transferred to them from the poet's own spirit which shoots its being through earth sea and air in the two following lines for instance there is nothing objectionable nothing which would preclude them from forming in their proper place part of a descriptive poem behold yon row of pines that shorn and bowed bend from the sea blast seen at twilight eve but with a small alteration of rhythm the same words would be equally in their place in a book of topography or in a descriptive tour the same image will rise into semblance of poetry if thus conveyed yon row of bleak and visionary pine by twilight glimpse discerned mark how they flee from the fierce sea-blast all their tresses wild streaming before them i have given this as an illustration by no means as an instance of that particular excellence which i had in view and in which shakespeare even in his earliest as in his latest work surpasses all other poets it is by this that he still gives a dignity and a passion to the objects which he presents unaided by any previous excitement they burst upon us at once in life and in power full many a glorious morning have i seen flatter the mountain-tops with sovereign eye not mine own fears nor the prophetic soul of the wide world dreaming on things to come the mortal moon hath her eclipse endured and the sad augurs mock their own presage uncertainties now crown themselves assured and peace proclaims olives of endless age now with the drops of this most balmy time my love looks fresh and death to me subscribes since spite of him i'll live in this poor rhyme while he insults o'er dull and speechless tribes and thou in this shalt find thy monument when tyrants crests and tombs of brass are spent as of higher worth so doubtless still more characteristic of poetic genius does the imagery become when it moulds and colours itself to the circumstances passion or character present and foremost in the mind for unrivalled instances of this excellence the reader's own memory will refer him to the lear othello in short to which not of the great ever-living dead man's dramatic works in opem m copia facit how true it is to nature he has himself finely expressed in the instance of love in his ninety-eighth sonnet from you have i been absent in the spring when proud pied april dressed in all its trim hath put a spirit of youth in everything that heavy satin laughed and leapt with him 
yet nor the lays of birds nor the sweet smell of different flowers in odour and in hue could make me any summer story tell or from their proud lap pluck them where they grew nor did i wonder at the lilies white nor praise the deep vermilion in the rose they were though sweet but figures of delight drawn after you you pattern of all those yet seemed it winter still and you away as with your shadow i with these did play scarcely less sure or if a less valuable not less indispensable mark gonimon men poeto hostis rema genarion lacoi will the imagery supply when with more than the power of the painter the poet gives us the liveliest image of succession with the feeling of simultaneousness with this he breaketh from the sweet embrace of those fair arms which bound him to her breast and homeward through the dark land runs apace look how a bright star shooteth from the sky so glides he in the night from venus eye four the last character i shall mention which would prove indeed but little except as taken conjointly with the former yet without which the former could scarce exist in a high degree and even if this were possible would give promises only of transitory flashes and a meteoric power is depth and energy of thought no man was ever yet a great poet without being at the same time a profound philosopher for poetry is the blossom and the fragrancy of all human knowledge human thoughts human passions emotions language in shakespeare's poems the creative power and the intellectual energy wrestle as in a war embrace each in its excess of strength seems to threaten the extinction of the other at length in the drama they were reconciled and fought each with its shield before the breast of the other or like two rapid streams that at their first meeting within narrow and rocky banks mutually strive to repel each other and intermix reluctantly and in tumult but soon finding a wider channel and more yielding shores blend and dilate and flow on in one current and with one voice the venus and adonis did not perhaps allow the display of the deeper passions but the story of lucretia seems to favour and even demand their intensest workings and yet we find in shakespeare's management of the tale neither pathos nor any other dramatic quality there is the same minute and faithful imagery as in the former poem in the same vivid colours inspirited by the same impetuous vigour of thought and diverging and contracting with the same activity of the assimilative and of the modifying faculties and with a yet larger display a yet wider range of knowledge and reflection and lastly with the same perfect dominion often domination over the whole world of language what then shall we say even this that shakespeare no mere child of nature no automaton of genius no passive vehicle of inspiration possessed by the spirit not possessing it first studied patiently meditated deeply understood minutely till knowledge become habitual and intuitive wedded itself to his habitual feelings and at length gave birth to that stupendous power by which he stands alone with no equal or second in his own class to that power which seated him on one of the two glory-smitten summits of the poetic mountain with milton as his compeer not rival while the former darts himself forth and passes into all the forms of human character and passion the one proteus of the fire and the flood the other attracts all forms and things to himself into the unity of his own ideal all things and modes of action shape themselves anew in the being of milton while shakespeare becomes all things yet for ever remaining himself o oh, what great men hast thou not produced england my country truly indeed we must be free or die who speak the tongue which shakespeare spake the faith and morals hold which milton held in everything we are sprung of earth's first blood have titles manifold End of chapter fifteen